As we prepare to listen for the word of God read and proclaimed, let us join together in the prayer for illumination. As we come to your word this day, O God, make peace in our hearts so that we may truly hear you and follow you. For it is in serving you that we find abundant life. Amen. Today's Old Testament reading is a bit of a spicy one, and it's from the Genesis, it's from Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 16. I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, and I will be reading it. So it's not what I'm saying, it's what the Bible says. <laughs> Got a little uncomfortable. All right, let us listen for God's word. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bore him no children. She had an Egyptian slave girl whose name was Hagar, and Sarai said to Abram, You see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go consort with my slave girl. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived for ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her slave girl, and gave her to her husband Abram as a wife. He was with Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong... Be done, may the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my slave girl to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Your slave girl is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she ran away from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on, her way, on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am running away from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, now you have conceived and shall bear a son. You shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He shall be a wild ass of a man, with his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he shall live at odds with all his kin. So she named the Lord who spoke to her, You are El Roy, for she said, Have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? Therefore the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. This ends our first reading. Our story of Sarah and Hagar continues later in Genesis, chapter 21, verses 8 through 21. Let us listen for God's word speaking to us this day. The child grew and was weaned, And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son, Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman and with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son, Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named after you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread with a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba, When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bowshot. 
For she said, do not let me look on the death of my child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid. For God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Mm. So this week begins our summer sermon series on the women of the Hebrew Scriptures. And y'all, after rereading these scriptures again in preparation for this service, I have to be honest and say, what was I thinking? (laughs) Seriously, what was I thinking? Why did I choose these? These are usually stories that I'm like, "Mm, someone else can preach on those. But I do love character stories in the Bible. I think we learn so much when we pay attention to who is singled out in the stories of our faith. Why are these women highlighted in this way? What is God saying to us through these characters? Why are these stories told? But y'all, these stories about Sarah, the matriarch of our biblical tradition, and Hagar They're tough, right? They're tough. They underscore unjust power structures that are present in the world. Did you feel that? Did you feel that tension of these awful societal structures that were in place? There are interactions with God which seem to imply an endorsement of suffering, God told Hagar to go back to Sarai. There are portrayals of women which pit them against one another, which I am always uncomfortable with because I am very aware of the fact that those who wrote these stories were men. So why were these stories written in this way? Like I said, Today's stories are tough. They are not easy parts of our tradition. So you might be asking, why, Eric? Why did you choose to include these stories? Why not, if you wanted to preach about Sarah, Why didn't you include the story about Sarah when she laughs, when God tells them that she's going to become a mother when she's really, really old? That's a great story, Eric. You should have started there. Y'all, I love that story. It is about Sarah, the namesake for my youngest. It inspired her naming. I love that story. But these stories about Sarah and Hagar are important. They are really, really important, and we don't spend time with them. Our lectionary often skips over them. Pastors like myself often look at them and say, oh, let me go somewhere else. Not doing that one. Because... There's a lot there. So let's take some time to dig a little deeper. I keep referring to Sarah as if she spells her name with an H, right? But in our first reading, if you heard it and if you saw it, 
she and Abraham are still called Abram and Sarai. At that point in the story, Abram and Sarai had been called out of their country to trust in the Lord to guide them to the promised land with the promise that the Lord would make a great nation through them. When they began that journey, Abram and Sarai were already at least 75 years old, and they were childless. Their journey brought them down into Egypt, where Sarai was taken as a concubine for the Pharaoh because she was so beautiful. God intervened in that situation, and, God, and Abram and Sarai fled Egypt into safety, where their household grew in property and size and people. But still, no children. I am sure that throughout this sojourn, the blessing of God was weighing on their minds. Lord, we are on this journey that you called us to. We are traveling this road with only you but our guidance, trusting that you will bring us to the promised land, trusting that you will give us what we've always wanted, a family. How will we become parents of a great nation when we are only getting older and older and older. God visits them again. God reaffirms the covenant and blessing, saying, no one but your very own issue shall be your heir, and your offspring shall be as numerous as the stars in the heavens. I bet that blessing was always present in Sarah's brain. I bet it just lived right in the front of Sarai's head, a constant source of comfort. But if I'm honest, it might have also been, at the same time, an agony that couldn't be voiced. Throughout my ministry, I have spoken with many, many couples who have had troubles conceiving, as they watched their families and friends, the families of their friends and others in their communities, grow and expand with reckless abandon. They have shared with me how painful and frustrating it was to want to share in the joy of their families and their friends, while at the same time enduring the heartache of wanting that joy for themselves. And that is without the promise of a divine blessing living on their shoulders, without the promise that through them a great nation as multitude as the stars in heaven would come forth from them. What must that have been like for Sarai, for Abram? The text tells us that it had been more than 10 years since the first covenant, which means that they are at least 85 years old. And I think for Sarai, it had just gotten to be too much, too long. So she began to take matters into her own hands. This promise is for us. I'm trusting God. I'm going to make some things happen. If she wasn't going to get pregnant, she was going to adopt some local customs to get what she was promised. As much as she wants to ignore the reality, as much as, sorry, as much as we want to ignore this reality, Abram and Sarai were building quite a household for themselves on this sojourn to the promised land. As they followed God, they also adopted some customs of the people whose lands they traveled through. This 
included slavery. They gathered people when they were conquered or landowners and kingdoms would give them people so that they would not enter their lands. And Abram and Sarai and their household just continued to grow. It is an uncomfortable part of our story, one that has been misused for generations, eons, to belittle, enslave people of color, people who are different, to make them less than. But here in this story, we recognize that Sarai believed that Hagar was her slave, and as such, any child that would issue from her would be hers. And this would allow God's promise to come to fruition. Forget the consequences. Forget the emotional turmoil it would cause. Sarai was ready to make things happen. A lot of interpretations of this text lay all the blame for what is to come on Sarai's shoulders. But I would like to point out that Abram didn't say, wait, Sarai, my beloved, let's just trust in God. Abram wasn't saying a thing. He wasn't saying let's wait for God's promise to come in its own time to play out in our shared lives. He didn't say a word of protest. He saw Hagar and that dim-witted man said, (laughs) okie-dokie. So let's not forget that, my friends. History has not been kind to Sarai, I believe, in this interaction, but Abram shares responsibility. So, Abram and Hagar conceive a child, and the dynamics between Sarai and Hagar change. How could they not change? That can be a very complicated family dynamic today, before the power dynamic of slavery is entered into that. So can you imagine what it was like for Hagar to suddenly have this privilege that she had never experienced before. Abram again claims no responsibility for helping to mediate a solution. Instead, he says, she's your slave, girl. You deal with it. Typical. Sarai does not handle the situation well or in what we would call today an emotionally intelligent way. It is so bad that pregnant Hagar flees. And while out in the wilderness, Hagar encounters the angel of the Lord, a privilege that is usually held close by the most important people to God. But the angel of the Lord appears to Hagar. And I have to say, it is a strange and weird encounter where she enjoys a blessing and a promise of her own that her son Ishmael will be a wild ass of a man. Aren't those the exact words that every mother-to-be wants to hear about her son? The angel also promises that her offspring will be greatly multiplied. But the angel of the Lord says you must go back to Sarai. You must go back to slavery. That is a lot. And I'm don't always know what to do with it. But she goes back, and Ishmael is born, and Ishmael is treated well. And then we jump ahead to chapter 21. 
And during the time in between this first part of our story and the second part of the story, Abram and Sarai officially become Abraham and Sarah, which will make my mouth very happy. And they are even older, 99 and 90 respectively, the text tells us. God's promises continue to get more specific, clearly identifying that Sarah will give birth to the future of the covenant relationship. And that is exactly what happens. Isaac is born. After Isaac is born, tensions once again rise, resulting in Hagar and Ishmael being sent away. But this time with a promise from God to go with them. These promises ensure that there is a future for Ishmael, that a nation will rise through him. The rest of the text is perplexing because this journey into this new future is perilous, with Hagar fearing for the life of her child. Like I said earlier, this is a very complicated part of God's story for God's people. Why do Hagar and Ishmael have to go through such events? The issues at play in these texts are multi-layered. Ancient societal norms, power dynamics, patriarchy, suffering, God's role in that suffering and God's role in providing the comfort. All of this complicated history, all of this reality that played out in the lives of this family happens, stems from the blessings of God. So many of us crave the blessing of God And we see in most of Scripture how that blessing provides a way out of no way. How the blessing of God again and again creates a future for God's people when there was none. But I think the gift of these complicated passages is that we see that blessings also come with complicating factors that blessings come with baggage that we don't anticipate. Blessings can be messy. Blessings can cause disruptions. For example, and this might be a bad example, but go with me for a second. I am often asked what it is like, what it was like to grow up in Charleston, South Carolina what it was like to grow up in such a beautiful place. And the truth of my response to that question is very complicated because it is truly a beautiful place, breathtakingly so. When you cross over bridges and you see the marshland spread out before you with either the moonlight or the sunlight hitting the water, it will take your breath away. But there is a lot of pain in the shadow of that blessed place. A place where that blessing has become such an obsession that an ideal of perfection has taken root there. And that definition of perfection is so narrowly held that it blocks out any change, any evolution, any space for people to be different or to be uniquely themselves. And it has been perverted into an obsession with antebellum customs and all of the pain and trauma that goes with it. Do you see? Blessings can have unexpected consequences when we try to force the blessings to come to fruition when we grow impatient with waiting for the blessing to come true or try too hard to direct the way the blessing unfolds or to who should receive that blessing. So we take over. We try to control the unfolding of God's blessing 
And people like Hagar, the powerless and the overlooked, get devalued and hurt. But because of God's faithfulness and grace, the blessing still comes. The blessing comes as God intends, not as we intend. But as we see with Sarah and Hagar, along with the way things, along the way things get messy and people can get hurt. As Cleveland celebrates Pride Weekend this weekend, I have been thinking a lot about the blessings of all my LGBTQ friends and family who are in my life. Created in God's image, these faithful friends have hidden themselves for so many years, trying to control and pretend, trying to fit into a measure of perfection that was forced upon them. Things have not always been easy for them in the church or in the world in general. And I have journeyed with them through many, many tough times. But I have also seen the transformation that has taken place in their lives and in the lives of some of their families by living authentically as the people they were created to be, by allowing the blessings of God that are present in their lives to be expressed authentically in the world around them. And the amazing part of that journey for them is the way their authenticity has freed their families and their friends and colleagues to become more authentically themselves. One of my best friends growing up came out when we were in college and his family broke down. And through the years of my friend not giving up, that family has grown stronger and become more authentically present with one another to the point where they no longer hid their health scares. They no longer hid the child that was born out of wedlock by my friend being exactly who he was created to be the gift and blessing manifested in ways that invited everyone around them to live more authentically in the presence of God and to know that they are deeply loved just as they are. That same human standard of perfection is alive and loose in other places in our world today. That sense of need to control the blessings of God and who's in and who's out and who's worthy and who's not. And I think the invitation of Sarah and Hagar is for all of us to let go of our need to reach the standard at all costs and instead to trust wholeheartedly and with reckless abandon in the promises of God to embrace the cliche, and forgive me, but we have to let go and let God. Let go and let God. Friends, this is not an easy path to follow, which is why God calls us to make the journey together, to spend time in community, to spend time in God's presence to be renewed by the power of God's promises at work in your life and to trust that inch by inch and day by day, those promises are growing to fruition in you and through you and by you so that you and all God's children may experience the blessing at work in their lives. And that together, you might navigate the messiness that might come because of it. Friends, let us trust in God's promise of blessing. As we move forward to embody God's covenantal promises, remembering that God's blessing is not for us alone, but that we are blessed 
to be a blessing, that we are blessed to make known God's love for all people, and that we inherited the blessing of Isaac and Ishmael, that through us, God will make a great nation of followers and believers who will transform the world. So let go and let God be at work in your heart and your mind this day and every day to come. Amen.